thanks for taking the time to come out and kind of hang out here. Let me go ahead and uh, just show, let's see, show my screen. I'll go ahead and I'll get rid of this. And what I wanted to do is just kind of spend some time talking to you a little bit about how to use this entire perfect layer software. And I think that w there's a couple of key things that you should keep in mind when working with this, right? Let me just kind of just share something with you. And this is probably going to put um, Brian on you know, one guy on the spot here. But you want to be able to do this. Keep in mind, this program is in a public preview. And, and, and I know that he mentioned it, but it's one of those things where we, this program announced and there was a lot of buzz behind it and we're really, really excited about them doing this. But is there some things that are going to kind of be messed up? Yeah. Is there some things that you're going to want to be able to see that it does? Yeah. You want to make sure that you download it. You want to make sure that you try it and you want to make sure that you put your two cents into it. That's kind of the, um, I, I tend to call that the responsibility of the person who's getting a free piece of software when you start. You know, you give it a shot, you kick the tires, and, and you can kind of see something cool. And if you can do something that can kind of put a little stamp of you inside the software, all the more reason to be able to send them some sort of feedback. So make sure you do take advantage of that kind of stuff. So I'm a Photoshop guy. I spend a lot of time working in Photoshop. However, with the advent of Lightroom, I'm finding that more and more a lot of the stuff that I do is inside of my Lightroom experience. So any time that I can kind of just keep myself inside of Lightroom, it turns out to be a really, really good thing. Also, one of the other things as a photographer that I'm keeping in mind is that it would be, it would be wrong if all of a sudden we turned around and we said, you know what, you just got a copy of Lightroom, you're a photographer. All you want to be able to do is just focus on these key components that you're working on with layers. What is the best way for you to be able to do that? If I turned around and I told you, hey, listen, you need to go buy a Photoshop license, right? That's going to run you 600, 700 bucks. That's something that you, you should have an option and you should have an alternative. So this, in, this piece of software, this public preview is kind of that time for you to be able to take a look at this and go, is this something that these guys developed, something that you want to use? So what I wanted to do is just kind of not focus on what's happening from the Photoshop side because I'm going to presume that you don't have it. This is going to be for people who don't have it. So we'll take a couple of different examples and we'll run those examples through from start to finish using this perfect layers workflow. Now, uh, at any point in time, if we have an issue, we'll just go ahead and uh, you can go ahead and just kind of stop me and we'll do some stuff with that. Now, here I have one picture that I did in New York. And I'll go, is everybody okay with seeing the screen? Brian, we're good on the screen? Oh, you're great. Okay, cool. So inside of here, I have, this is actually shot at uh, Top of the Rock in New York City. So you'll see that there's some people here shooting over the glass. And if you ever make it into the New York, if you make it into New York City era, don't try to shoot right here. Don't worry about those guys. There's actually a little level, one level up from there. Stand on top of there, and then you can sometimes get them out of the frame. But I was shooting near sunset. This is kind of cool of a picture, but you'll notice that there's definitely a lack of color that's kind of sitting here. Right? I'd like to be able to take that, and I want to be able to put in some color and put in some detail inside of this one image. More often than not, if I were doing this inside of a Photoshop workflow, what I would do is I would bring this into Photoshop and then from there I would go ahead and I would set up a blend mode. Blend modes inside of Perfect Layers is something that I think is going to definitely help you from a photographic standpoint. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to File, Plugin Extras, and I'm going to go to Perfect Layers. That'll always bring up this entire video series where you can kind of learn how to be able to do it. I tend to keep it up. I leave the check mark on there because it doesn't really bother me. I'll just click on close. Every now and again, I'll jump in and take a look at if there's something that I've missed. But this is it. And this is the thing, too, that I, that I did want to point out. If it seems like it's sparse and if it seems like it's easy, it's supposed to. Remember that this is a program that's only really supposed to do one thing, and that's give you layers. So 
you don't want necessarily the learning curve that you're going to get inside of Photoshop or inside of elements and dealing with organizers and dealing with filters. That's not what this is for. This is to be able to take a series of images and either composite them, stack them together, or reorganize them. So the feature set that they're working with is supposed to be very, very small and very, very easy so that your learning curve isn't really all that hard. Right? You just want to focus on this one specific component. So right now, you'll take a look, and we're in this one screen here. You have a series of layers, and right now, one of the layers that we have here is background. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to double-click on this one, and I'm going to call this original. I hit the Enter key, and I'm pretty much done. Now, what I'd like to be able to do is amplify the color that we see here in this area. To do that, what I can do is I can grab this layer and make a copy of it, and then use the blend modes to be able to enhance the color. So under the layer menu, you'll see that you have an option called Duplicate. I'm going to go ahead and click on Duplicate. And now I have a second copy of something that we can work with. Now, the blending modes are these blending modes that are here. If you click on the drop down, you'll see that you see only a subset of blend modes that you would normally see inside of Photoshop. Does that mean that the blend modes that they have in Photoshop are better or worse? No, this just means that there's a small subset. If you think that there's a blend mode in here that benefits you, and right? if you're a Photoshop user and you kind of want to contribute, tell them. They might say no, but you might be surprised. They might say yes. Generally, these are the blend modes that uh, photographers tend to use when they're working with their images. So lighten and darken pretty much do what they're supposed to do. And one of the things that I think is kind of cool is that when you hover over these things, you tend to see differences, something that in Photoshop, you would have to just kind of select and then kind of go up and down and up and down, but this is kind of cool. You just hover, it shows you what happens. It takes portions of a document and it makes them brighter. Multiply. It takes portions of a document and augments color or makes things darker. So you'll notice that we lost the entire downside of all of this here. Overlay, soft light, hard light, color. You tend to see overlay, soft light, and hard light when you're working with things like um, textures and patterns. Uh, screens and multiplies, you tend to see when you're working with uh, recompositing like fill light or exposure corrections. A lot of the times, people use screen and multiply. In this case, you'll see that multiply tends to work a little bit better for me. So I'm going to click on multiply, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to call this dark sky. Now my sky set up there, and all of this here at the bottom looks very, very dark. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to grab this brush and paint back in this entire area. So right now, everything is dark. If I select my paint out option, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click right here. And or actually here, let me just do this one more time. You'll see there's some stuff that's happening right there as you paint in and you paint out. And all you're really trying to do in this one area is make an adjustment to this. So you'll see right now I'm painting out that information that you see here in the sky. I'm painting that out so that you can see the layer that sits underneath it. If I want, what I can do is I can make my brush a lot bigger and I can bring down my feather. You'll notice that there's a circle in the center, which is where your actual brush starts. And then that second circle that you see on the outside is kind of what it feathers out to. More often than not, this is what your brush looks like. But then what will happen is that you'll have a very, very hard edge. Like you see the hard edge that you have right there on the building. If you tend to use a feathered brush, and I'm a big fan of just kind of using a decent sized feather, what will happen is you'll kind of taper to that. So you notice that as I go over that one area, the transition to that color or the transition to that shade tends to look a little bit better. Now I can come back in here and I can start pulling all of this information. And all I'm doing now is just using a Wacom pen to be able to kind of bring myself in here. So I'll get this kind of set up in this one area. And then at that point, I can go ahead and I can just bring down my brush a little bit more. And 
how you do this or how much time you spend on this is going to be entirely up to you. Obviously, if I wanted to do a pretty good job of this, what I would do is I would just come back in here and just kind of keep switching from paint in and paint out. And bring this in here. And I, personally, what I would like to see is I'd like to see like a keyboard shortcut that swaps us between paint in and paint out. But this isn't too bad. Just come back in here and just paint in. Come back here, paint out. I don't get ourselves. I just heard I just heard a couple of keyboards, so that means that Brian's sitting there going, Yeah, we should. I'm I'm just trying to see if the X key will work. Yeah. So it, so in photo, but you know, but it, but it's but I think that one of the points I was going to turn around and I was going to say, oh, you know what? Just it, I'd like to see the X key. But again, we're, I'm keeping in mind here that the guy, the people that are here watching this stuff, you probably don't have Photoshop, or you, we're assuming that you don't have Photoshop. And if you don't have Photoshop, then you're probably going, oh, what's the X key? Well, you know, X key is this key that allows you to do swapping a foreground and background color. In this case, it doesn't make sense. So just a key, something that swaps you between painting in and painting out, would be nice. But you'll notice that in no time, all I did was just paint in, paint out. I can go back in here and zoom in. Right? If I click on the zoom tool, I can just click and drag this one area and zoom into this one area and kind of clean that up. If I hold on the option key and just click out, I can go ahead and I can zoom back out in my document. I'll go ahead and move my hand tool to kind of just bring this into... The center of the screen. So a little bit of playing around with this can kind of get you up and running. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to close this file and you'll notice that by default what it's doing is it's saving this as a Photoshop file format. I'm going to click on save. It'll create this composite image and at some point I could always just come back to it and just kind of trim out this one section. I just think that it would be very annoying if you just kind of sat there and just watched me trim out and expose correct the top of the Empire State Building would be like watching paint dry. But that's that, that's pretty much it. Though that's one example where you can go ahead and you can use this to be able to make that kind of correction. Now, uh, questions so far on that stuff before I actually before I go. Um, actually, a, a number of people were asking us as you were bringing it up. You know whether the. Uh, there will be a shortcut key for swapping between paint in and paint out. And one of the, I guess, uh, functions or additions that we're going to be adding in the final version are going to be a, a larger suite of shortcut keys. Like right now, if you are familiar with Photoshop, we do have some of the, the shortcut keys like Command J will dupe a layer, um, as well as com Command or Commander Control, rather, Control on a PC, plus and minus. But RC, one of the questions that a user had earlier was more of a, of a gear question. They wanted to know what lens you used to get this shot? Oh, the lens that I used for this. In, in Now, keep in mind, inside of Lightroom, when you're shooting, you'll see right here at the very, very top right that it says uh, focal length is at 14. So I'm using a 14 millimeter. Uh, since this was, this was shot, I want to say this was shot with my D3S. Um, let me just check my metadata here. Let's go to my EXIF. So, oh no, this is shot with a D700. So, chances are this was a this was a 14 to 24 Nikon 14 to 24 millimeter. So, pretty high 14 to 24. And here, just on a quick gear side, probably one of my favorite things to be able to use. And I know that um, we don't have that much time, but it's just uh, let's see, Manfrotto arm. Okay, arms, 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 arms. This thing right here, this variable friction arm, that right there is awesome. Basically, this thing collapses down to nothing. And then you combine this with this kind of clamp that sits right here. That thing I throw in my bag all the time. And let me see if I can actually... Yeah, so see this super clamp? This super clamp, I don't like this arm, this the one with the arm here, because what happens is it doesn't allow you to make it tighter. It's not a tension. It's a, it's a lock it or don't lock it, but it doesn't vary. So this this rig setup right here, plus this, I, I throw it in my bag, and whenever I get to a spot where they turn around and they say that there's no uh, tripods allowed, I usually just pull that out. I throw that on the railing, so it's taped to a railing that sits right here, and 
it can't say anything. It's not a tripod, right? And it, it's as hard as a tripod. So usually I clamp it on, I set that up, and I'm good to go. Yeah, I remember RC actually, I think... I I think Scott posted a blog post where he you you were telling him I think about the the clamp because you used it over here didn't you? Yeah. Uh, and I remember and when I saw that I actually went out and I bought it for myself too because like that's a great idea. It's one of those great alternatives when you you're not allowed to use a tripod or you just can't get your tripod through. Yeah. And uh, like here, take a look at this. Uh, this well, these were actually shot with a tripod. Um, no, nah, that was a tripod. That was a tripod. That was a tribe. These are all pictures uh, that are going to be in the um, HDR book. But this one right here, I actually shot that with a with that arm, with that same arm, and it kind of brings us into the next example of what we were going to talk about, which is how to be able to work with textures inside of Photoshop. Like I took this image from this was actually taken from the top of the Empire State Building, and it, this is the Fuller Building in New York City, or the Flatiron Building. A lot of times people call the Flatiron is about 120 millimeters. So I was using a 70 to 200 at f11, half a second. So if you go to the very, very top of the Empire State Building, you'll notice that there's like this suicide fence that goes all the way around it, which is just a protective fence for people not to jump off. Um, but the fence is pretty thick, right? It's pretty thick wire. So to hold this for a half a second and be able to get this kind of detail would have been pretty hard. So took that same rig, they scanned it, it went through their security and you were able to kind of get in here and pull some stuff out. Actually, I think I probably have a better frame that's a little bit better than this one because uh, it looks like some of this can be a little bit soft. Uh, let's see. Now in here, what I did is I took that same image and I turned it into a black and white. So now I have this black and white image and what I'd like to be able to do is I, I kind of want to be able to give it a little bit of texture. I want to kind of make it seem a little bit more old timey than this image. So to be able to do that, what I'd like to be able to do is, is merge this with some patterns and some textures. So I have here some textures that I tend to use, right? So it's just textures that I've collected all over the internet. Just random stuff. So that's Boca. Those are some lines. Um, I kind of like that one. I think that'd be kind of cool. So I almost this. I, I went through a glass phase, and everything had glass at one point. So this one looks pretty decent. Texture, and all I'm doing right now is just reading this at the very, very top. Textures dash twenty seven. Chances are, inside of Lightroom, I'm not saving my textures. You could, right? I, I just tend not to. But if I'm not saving it, then I'm going to need to be able to merge that file with this file as well. So what I'll do is I'll go over here to go to File, I'll go to Plugin Extras, and I'm going to go to Perfect Layers. This will take a copy of this one file, and it throws it inside of the On One section. Now we're good to go. And what I'll do here is I now need to be able to take that texture and bring that texture into this. So I'm going to click on File, and under the File menu, you'll notice that just because you didn't go into the Light, you know, just because you were in Lightroom and you called it, doesn't necessarily mean that you can't add a file from somewhere else. So if I click on File, Add Layers from File, I'm going to get, I'm going to click OK. I'm going to go to my RC directory. I'm going to go to my Work directory. I'm going to go to my Textures directory, and inside of here. I'm going to find the texture that I was looking for. All right, so there it was, Textures 27. I'll go ahead and I'll click on Open. It'll grab that texture and it'll put that texture on top of this document. Now, it doesn't look like it fits, but keep in mind that it's a texture. So if you get any kind of pixelation or anything, it's going to be a little bit acceptable because this is actually going to be used to roughen up a lot of the stuff that you're working with here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to take my move tool here and I'm going to click right on this layer. You'll notice that you get some transformation handles on the corners of this. And to make it a little bit easier, maybe what I'll do is I'll switch to my zoom and I'm going to hold down the option or the alt key and just click out a couple of clicks 
and I'm going to move with the hand tool, switching to the hand tool, I'll move this here to the center. Now let's go ahead and go back to this one here. I'm going to click on this one, and I'm just going to drag it to the upper left-hand corner. Once I have it set there, I can go ahead and just drag this all the way over to the lower right-hand corner and switch my blend modes and start playing with them. So you'll notice there's multiply, there's overlay, there's soft light, there's hard light, there's color. I'm thinking overlay is kind of cool. It still looks kind of like a little creepy and a little washed out. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab the opacity of that layer and start dropping it. And as I start dropping the opacity for that, you'll notice that it adds some textures in these sections. It adds some textures in these sections. It adds some textures in these areas here. Sometimes when you do this, what will happen is it'll turn around and it'll start making the image kind of look cool, but some areas tends to lose um, a lot of detail or a lot of color or a lot of tone. So what I tend to do from here is once I apply a texture, what I'll do is I'll go back to this background layer. And inside this background layer, I'll go ahead and I'll make a copy. And we know that it said it was Command and Control J to be able to do it. I got that off the layer menu. I'll take this layer and I'll bring this layer above it. So this is the original. This is my textured. This is my background again. So original or an original. I'll take this top original one here and I'll start cycling through these blend modes. And you'll notice that as I'm doing that, you start getting a different kind of composite for what you were working on. So right now, if I swing this back into the color side, take a look. Any kind of color shifts that we got automatically get removed. So here it got yellow and dingy, which I may want, but if I don't want it, I have the option to be able to just kind of bring this, switch this mode back to the color. It just takes the color of that layer, and now all you do is have the distressing of this in the areas that you want, but none of the discoloration. At any point in time, if I want to paint out some of that color, I could just use the option for painting out with a mask. I'll go ahead and I'll make a decent sized brush just to show you. I could always just come back here, and there's that color. And paint it back in. And if I want to add just a little bit of nuance to it, I could always just come back over here and drop the opacity to this and then just kind of softly paint in some of this just to give it just a tiny bit of age. So I'll just come into these areas, a little bit of wash there. Yeah. Let's go ahead and just increase the opacity just a little bit more and draw some happy clouds. and you start getting a little bit of texture. Now, once that's done, I'm going to close the file, did a Command W, I'll go ahead and I'll do a save, and that information starts getting saved, and then you'll see this inside of Lightroom. Yeah, RC, that you bring up a good point. There were several people who were wondering whether this this work you do gets updated in Lightroom. And right, and we'll take... And we'll take, a, we'll take a look at that here, because take a look. I, I tend to store a lot of my stuff inside of collections, right? So if you look inside of Lightroom, I have a series of, I have tons of different collections that hold a lot of different things. So I'm a big collection sets and collections kind of guy. But one of the things that you're going to notice is that if I go over here to my New York City, that change that we did to New York City doesn't show up here. If you go into New York City 2, that change that we did to this document doesn't show up here. In order for you to find this, you're going to have to go into your all pictures to be able to find that change. So you'll see what I did was I have my New York City 2 selected here, right? Once I have it selected, you switch to all photographs. It's going to bring you right to that exact same spot, but in the all photograph section. The one to the right of it is the PSD file that we did with the treatment. I'll go ahead and I'll grab this and I'll drag this back into my collection so that I have them side by side. Now, is this something that's atypical to uh, perfect layers? Absolutely not. It's something that's been a long-standing problem in any plugin 
Um, don't know why that's the case. I'm sure Adobe has a good reason for it. But any time that you use, you can be using Nick software, you can be using Unwon software, you can be using Photomatics, you can be using anything. Anything that you use that's a plugin doesn't live inside of the pro doesn't live inside of Lightroom. They're just plugins. Everything is a plugin. So when you go out and you try to come back in, it never puts it back inside of a collection. So it's the bane of my existence when I'm using Photomatics because if I'm in Photomatics and I create a merge, then I try to come back and then it's not there. I got to go look for it. So that's a bit of a pain. The only other thing that you can probably do is just name the file something different and then do a smart filter against it. So when, like, for example, whenever I export out an HDR file, I always tag the word HDR to it. So then I have a smart collection where all it does is it looks for the word HDR in an image. And then I have all of those in one spot. So let's go ahead and just go back over here. So original on one side, which I liked. I mean, I thought this was a cool original, but you know, this one looks a little bit more treated. It looks a little bit more dated, which is kind of what I was looking for when I did this one shot. Questions, concerns? How are you guys doing? No, everyone's actually great. And um, the few people did bring that up. Like it doesn't update in a collection. That is a weird thing with Lightroom. The only, the, the, Difference if you launch if you send your images from perfect layers from a folder like one of your root folders and I'm with RC I use collections smart collections all the time you kind of if you do it from a folder it will update but not from a collection and it's just weird um, so yeah, and it's it's like everybody runs into that same problem any plugin runs into the same problem you, you don't go back into the collections thing it, it's it is weird it's almost like it doesn't uh, it doesn't send back any of the uh, collection information. Uh, when you save it, so uh, just you, you just have to do what RC did. Um, go to your either the folder or your all phot photos and drag it to your collection. And this is a, here's just another quick Lightroom tip for you to be able to do that. Let's just say, for example, I'm over here, right, and I have this image set up. Uh, I'm gonna go here. I'll just go, just grab this image. I'm inside of a collection. I single click on the image that I want. I switch to all photographs. Every now and again, you'll do this. Now, you're in a completely different area over here, and what will happen is you'll turn around and you'll go into freakout mode, which will be like, oh, my God, I had, I had the image selected. I don't know where it is. I don't know what to be able to do. This page to somewhere completely different. Um, but keep, down, keep in mind, down here, you have this selected. You have the image that you wanted selected. You just moved your grid somewhere. If you have this collapsed and you don't see that at all, then you're really going to panic. Don't worry about it. What I would do is this. You have your image selected. You switch to all photographs. Let's say that you're somewhere. Every time I scroll, I'm like, dear God, please let me land somewhere safe. So <laughs> let's say that you're in this part, but you remember that you selected. All you have to do is hit your right or your left arrow. If you hit your left arrow, it'll automatically bring you to that area where those pictures are selected. So if this spot in the center starts looking a little weird, then right or left arrow, it'll automatically bring you to that one side. A little bit of a Lightroom tip. Take a look at this. This is kind of cool. This is a pictures that I did of my daughter, so it's a shameless, a shameless plug. Oh, wow, I must have moved my Easter pictures. Uh, shameless plug. So this is my daughter, and what I want to do is I want to make a little bit of a collection, but it looks like I'm running into a problem here. Whenever I shoot inside a Lightroom, I always shoot and I import to my desktop. So I'll take my folder and if I have a compact flash card, I take the compact flash card, import it, import to the desktop. But then I offload that stuff into an external drive. And I do that because more often than not, whenever I'm working with something, let's say you go out and you shoot, you shoot 300 shots. If you're working and you upload to an external drive immediately, there's a very, very good chance that out of those 300 shots, 200 of them are garbage. They are with me. I mean, they should be, right? You're not going to get 300 perfect shots. So rather than me upload to my external hard drive 300 shots that I may not use, what I do is I upload the shots to my hard drive, and then I do my pick and reject, pick and reject, pick and reject, whittle out all of the excessive garbage that happens there. 
And then I have a smaller collection and I take that collection and I put that finally back into my Lightroom collection. So if you look inside of here, I'll just go ahead and I actually moved it already. I called it Easter 2011. But I didn't update what was happening here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to right click on this image. Once I right click on the image, I'm going to go to the folder in the library. It's going to automatically bring me here. See, it's on the desktop. It's looking for Easter 2011. And all I have to do is just do a right click, find missing folder. Goes to my Lightroom directory. I go to my Easter 2011 and just click choose. And that's it. All of the images are now referenced the way that I want them to be referenced. So it takes a little bit of an extra step to be able to do that, but the protection that you get with not necessarily having to, you don't want to jam your external hard drive with a whole bunch of stuff that you don't necessarily need. And you may have rejected, but you didn't delete. And, you know, if I don't have to push that much to the drive, I'm not going to. So here's a picture of her. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to take these four pictures and I want to be able to merge them with this one that I did. So she's, this is Easter. She was reading her book. And I figured if we took this file and we took this file and took this file, and this file and put them in that last one would be kind of cool the only thing that I'm not liking is the fact that it looks like she's eating a peep next to her electrical socket so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna change that it's like this is what happened right before but I figured you know what cool I can I can deal with it it's only really in two two frames it's these two frames uh, so let's go ahead and do this I'm gonna grab this file I'm gonna shift click all of these other files and I'll go to file plug in extras and perfect layers. I'm going to export these out. In the meantime, while that's exporting out, does anybody else have any questions? No, I think we're good. Cool. And, and, and this is the kind of thing, this is what gets me really excited about it, to be completely honest with you, because it's obviously, I'm a Photoshop guy. Obviously, we work with Photoshop and with Elements and all that stuff. But if you're just a person that's doing Lightroom, and all you want to be able to do is just this kind of stuff. You don't want to go get a really, really big program. And I'm looking at this and I go, this is kind of cool, you know, it, it, to be able to do this and not have to break the intellectual bank. You know, that part I think is key. You know, I'm going to zoom out here. I have the zoom tool. And, oh, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out. I must have zoomed in entirely too much here. Click, click, click. Uh, okay. Now, run into a snag, fit. Run into another thing, go over here to your navigator, 50%, 25%. So, when in doubt, if this doesn't work for you, come over here. Just use these loop sections. So now I have a series of files that are here. I'm going to get and I'm going to grab these files. And this is something that we talked about. Right now, at its present version, you don't have the option to be able to shift click a series of files and move all four files at once. That is something that they are working on. So I would just be advised that that is something that they're cooking up. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit more just to kind of keep myself. Oh, let's go ahead and uh, it's just being a little temperamental for me here. I'm going to move myself all the way over here. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to grab this first file here at the top. And I'm going to use this, and I'll go ahead and I'll shrink it. I'll get this kind of set up, and I'll bring this over here. And come on, Sabine. Bring this in this one area there, then directly into that. I'll grab that file, do the same thing. Right now, they are also working on uh, proportions. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Brian. You guys are working on proportions and scaling and things like that? You know it. Uh, the, the equivalent of holding a shift key to lock proportion as well as rotating layers is coming. So what I did was I just grabbed the first one, and once I have the first one set, I'm just scaling to that first one. And then I'll move it over here to this side. I'll come over here and I'll grab the third one. Having the third one set, I'm just going to keep using that top right one as my base and it just makes it a lot easier for me to just kind of get myself to where I need to go once I do that bring this right here and maybe like a 
tad bit smaller. I'll have to go, I'm going to go back and fix that one later. I'll grab this last one, bring it over here, and bring this a little bit smaller, and now bring that over here. Now, at this point, I could always just go back to these files and just kind of make this one just a little bit smaller and bring this back here and then just do the same thing from a positioning standpoint because of the way that I set them up it works on the top files then it lets me work on the bottom files now as soon as they get that scaling thing down this is going to be infinitely easier for you to be able to do but the key with all of this stuff during this preview is for you to just see if this concept is something that you guys are going to dig you know if you dig the concept then they'll go ahead and they'll start working on kind of cleaning up the concept for you once we have that all set I'm gonna go ahead and close this file I'm gonna click on save that'll go ahead and it'll take this entire composite now obviously these are big high-res files that now I have five of them, but still in a relatively short amount of time, they were able to push that information. Again, having these files selected, I have to go back into my all photographs area and find where that file is set up. Sometimes if you run into a snag where you can't find it because it was like a series of images, the other thing that I usually tell people is go to the view menu and set your sort order. And if you set your sort order, you can go ahead and you can also select your files that way. If you run into an absolute worst case scenario, the other way for you to be able to do it is for you to be able to use a smart collection. A smart collection is going to allow you to be able to find specific files based on specific types. So if I were to come over here and go to a smart collection, I could always create a smart collection and I can call it, uh, let's see, I'll call it Beanie Easter Shots. And I can say, look, I have these specific characteristics. I probably wouldn't call it Beanie Easter Shots, but I figured I'd throw in a Lightroom tip in here as well. Let's say we call it Photoshop Files. I can say, I need you to match the following rule. If you have a specific file type that happens to be a Photoshop file, you click on Create, and what that's going to do is it's going to bring you those files. Now, if I want to be able to kind of make it even more specific, I could always come back over here and just add another rule. And I can say, hey, guess what? If there is some text information, let's say the file name, happens to contain the word Easter. Now it's going to find anything that has a file name of Easter that happens to be a Photoshop file. This is a great way for you to be able to separate stuff. I know for a fact that I have more than one Easter shot. You see, that's when I was playing with that before you'll notice that there's no sockets. So this one with the sockets. And all we really did for the sockets is we just went over here to the develop module. I just clicked on my clone tool, clicked on the socket, moved into one spot. You'll notice that kind of like the, the edges of the socket are still there, but once you let it go, they're gone. Using my hand tool, move over to this one spot. There's my socket. I'm going to go ahead and just bring the size of my clone down a little bit. Maybe not too much. A little bit bigger here still. Too much. Right there. Now you'll notice that when in... Oh! Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Let's go to 75. If it gives me any grief, then what I'll do is this. I'll grab one, I'll come over here, and I can just make it bigger and smaller, move the source to wherever I need it. If it does that too much, you can always go back and just kind of redefine that crop as you need it, or, or redefine that clone as you need it. So I can go, uh, I didn't mean to do that one here. But it was just make this a little bit smaller, take this one side, move it over here, and then come over here, grab this last side, move it over here. So there's actually three clones that are in play. Right, There's one main clone that's there, there's a second clone, there's a third clone. 
And now I can probably just go back over here and just make one more fourth clone and kind of get rid of it. If I wanted, I would probably just go back and take a look at the original image, clone that out so that it looks a little bit more like this one. But in a relatively short amount of time, you can get and you can get all of this, this kind of stuff taken care of very, very quickly. And I think that that's the key point with all of this is can you do this stuff fast? And these are composites that you normally wouldn't be able to do if you were just working inside of Lightroom. So I think it's a, it's a positive thing. Questions on this part so far? Um, not on this part, but there was a few people asking when you're done, RC, if you can bring back the uh, Manfrotto clamps that you were talking about. <laughs> we've got our gearheads here, and I love it. Oh, sorry. All right. So, here, magic arm. Let me let me go back. It's kind of hard for the for you to be able to buy it. It's this one right here, the 244N variable friction. I don't know why. See, you'll see that there's a 143A that has the magic arm with the camera bracket. You want the camera bracket. You want the arm. You just don't want this arm with the bar. So, what I would recommend you do instead is I would recommend that you get there's the bracket, right? So that would be a camera bracket, and then you put your plate right there. And then I would get this arm, 244N, and then from there, I would get the uh, super clamp. I just got to find out what the what the skew for the super clamp is. So it's, so it's this one here, impact super clamp. So it's called impact. I'm just typing it into the chat module. So impact super clamp with stand. So that super clamp plus that arm plus that camera plate. Awesome. I, I, I even use it like if I'm driving somewhere because sometimes I'm driving at my camera just in the passenger seat and I need to be able to take a quick shot. I open the door, super clamp the uh, super clamp um, the arm to the door, like to the doorways. I just open my door and then right on the door, I'll go ahead and I'll clamp it to there or I'll clamp it into the frame of the car and then set up my camera. But I'm that guy, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'm with you. Cool. Any other question on that? Oh, people are digging that. Um, I'm just trying to see uh, what metadata. Uh, so there was a question as to what, what metadata is included. And the metadata that is in your um, original file, like the copyright information, that will get saved through perfect layers. So you'll see that information um, brought in. And then, RC, if you could just show people where the clone tool is in, our, in uh, Lightroom. Oh, OK. Yeah, sure. So inside of here, when you're doing cloning, right, if you're in the develop module, under basic, you have all your basic stuff. But here at the very, very top, you have crop. And to the right of that, you have a clone tool. And it doesn't really tell because it looks like it's a circle that's pointing to the eye. So a lot of the times, people miss it because they think it's like an eye tool. But this is the clone tool over here at the top. To the right, then, is the eye for red eye reduction. Then you have gradients and then you have an adjustment brush. And the adjustment brush lets you kind of bring in, bring in some exposure, some brightness, some contrast. The only problem with the adjustment brush sometimes in Lightroom is that you don't have that option to be able to kind of do blend modes and things like that. And I think that that's, that's where I, I would prefer to go over to Perfect Layers over doing it here. Awesome. All right, RC. Um, I'm going to take control. I really appreciate it. Is there, I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to quickly show, but um, that was awesome. There are actually a few people who really were, were digging your uh, texture overlay example. Cool. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate that. No, not a problem. Uh, not a problem. And happy to, ha happy to be able to help along. Very awesome. I'm just going to take control right now. Sure. RC. I'm going to start sharing my screen. And I, I just want to quickly go over a few things that came up. Uh, or rather that I brought up earlier, specifically if we have Aperture users out there, I don't want them to feel neglected. Um, I'm just going to delete this image really quickly here because this is a quick example to show you how to get perfect layers uh, access directly within Aperture. So Aperture is an app. You might be on your on my screen still. I just clicked on stop showing screen. Oh, really? I see it broadcasting on my recorder. Oh, cool. Okay, never mind then. Yeah, I think we're...
Okay. Let me uh, let me bring up my questions module on this computer to see whether people see. Guy, can a few of you just chime in whether you see my screen or? Okay, yeah, they're seeing my screen. Cool. Very interactive bunch. Thank you guys. Um, all right, so Aperture. Aperture is an Apple only product, and in the final version, we will have fully baked support for Aperture, so you can install it and it'll be fully functional and accessible. For now, if you want to work with perfect layers, just go to the Aperture menu item and then go to Preferences. You'll go to this Export tab, and the first field is called External Photo Editor. Just select Choose, navigate down to the Perfect Layers folder. Uh, and select perfect layers and then hit select. And that's going to add it here. You can select what file format you want to use as well as um, whether you have a calibrated profile display, which I think everyone, it's critical that you have. Um, and then when you're done, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to duplicate this just like you would in Lightroom. I'm going to just duplicate this version and desaturate it, boost the contrast so we get kind of an edgier black and white. I'm then going to select both of these images and now because you set perfect layers as an external editor when you go to photos you'll see edit with perfect layers so if you select it it'll send both images to perfect layers you'll have your uh, layers just as you would expect this can be color this can be uh, black and white and then we can do things like add a blending mode and like RC had mentioned as you hover over each one you'll get a live preview now it's important, and this goes uh, with Photoshop as well, there are a lot of blending modes. Don't stop at the first one you like. This may be the one you want to use, and in this case, this is what I want to use. But do yourself an extra couple minutes of justice and really pay attention to the other ones. So, And then go back to the one that you really think you like, because you can go to overlay, and it turns out that hard light can be better. So we'll select hard light. You can select a masking brush. I typically mask when I'm removing things. I try to keep my opacity down and keep a really big uh, feather. And then just in broad strokes, um, just paint back some of that original skin tone uh, as you see fit. And if you want to bring some of it uh, back in, just change from paint out to paint in. I usually drop my opacity uh, down even more when I'm painting back in so I can control the progression of that mask. Also, you can if you go to the show mask drop down you can see these um, the overlaid effect you see where you're painting in you can also change it to white if the overlay is too dark so you can get a better idea oops you know I painted into the hair so you might want to fix that and then as well as the classic grayscale view which is the current mask view and our other uh, suite products when you're done you would go to file save and this will update that PSD file that gets created as soon as you send your images to perfect layers a PSD is created. The way Aperture currently works is it'll duplicate each image that you send. So you can just delete these images and now you've got your perfect layers composite. 